welcome back to the Patriarch Convention 2022 of Orlando, Florida, being held for the fourth year in a row right here in Orlando at the Super Duper Triple 21 Summit event. Our next speaker is a returning speaker to the Patriarch Convention for speaking at our event in 2020, uh, way back in the day now, two years ago, right? Time flies. He's an amazing speaker. He's one of the most powerful and most popular and most viral speakers we have ever had on 21 Studios, at 21 Summit, at the Patriarch, 21, everything that we do. And my understanding on our channel, he has over 7 million views just on our channel, never mind his own. And he's also a very popular YouTuber in his own right, content creator. He's a former college basketball coach for women. He's a father of two, Patriarch, super badass guy. And I call him a personal friend of uh, 21 Convention. He's been very good to what we do at these events. So I'm very proud to introduce Coach Greg Adams to the stage. Welcome, Coach Thank Greg. Thank you, bro. What's up, gentlemen? Thanks for having me here again. And uh, this is the patriarch version of the, the speech here. We're gonna talk about father-son bond. And I thought that would be important because I've been studying, I have a son, I have a daughter, and I'm also um, a son of a mother, right? I grew up with a single mother primarily. I have a great relationship with my mother and my father. He didn't just leave for Marlboros and Newports and milk. All right, we have a bond and uh, I lived with him off and on in, a, in my younger years and then I lived with him when in my teenage years. But we talk about father-son bond because in our society, one of the most uh, broken bonds is the father-son relationship. People take it for granted. Sometimes people think they can remove the father and then the child will turn out well. And that's one of the problems because a lot of times men, men get pushed out of families and then young men grow up without the father and then there's issues. Similar to when you hear the phrase daddy issues, right? Daddy issues. Daddy issues is attributed to a woman who doesn't have proper relationship with the father. And the response to that is, she goes chaotic, right? She's in these streets. She's a fabulous 304. She gets ran through more times than the Holland Tunnel. She has multiple male partners and then she's trying to find this connection with the man that she doesn't have with the father. But what happens when the son doesn't have that connection with the father? Do we say the son has daddy issues? Sometimes we might say he's a mother's boy and we're going to attribute the mother, the, the fact that he can't mature as a man because he has an attachment to the mother. Now, we're going to talk about two things here. Son husbands and the Oedipus complex, circa Sigmund Freud. OK, so we're going to talk about those two issues because those two issues are going to be relevant to the topic today. All right. So let's take a look at what we have in terms of slide. The father son bond. OK. There he is, Mr. I left the family, okay, for a pack of Newports and milk. So this phrase, I want you to remember, we hear this a lot. The father left, dot, dot, dot. Most of the time it's the father left, period. Now, many times you don't need an explanation further. Because you hear that the father left, which means he abdicated his, his responsibility as a parent. And he was a jerk, asshole, deadbeat, and so forth and, and so on. We just go ahead and complete that sentence. The father left, he was an asshole, he was a jerk. He didn't live up to his responsibility. He left the family. I was reading a bio because I was doing a live stream on an R&B artist. I'm not gonna name his name. I'm gonna try to not name celebrities directly. But if I want to go viral, maybe I'll do it. Uh, the R&B artist's name is Tyrese. And I was doing a show because he had been going through a child support issue. And he had been going through several reckless behaviors with women that have resulted in child support issues, combated female, family court, and so forth and so on. And I went to his bio. I said, let me understand who the man is. Well, in the bio, it said his mother's name is so-and-so, his father's name is so-and-so. The next sentence, the father left. And I said, there it is. 
There it is. And then it continued with this story from there. That gap is not filled. What do you mean the father left? What does that mean? Why did he leave? Did he try to have a relationship with him during the, the, the intermediate, intermediate, intermediate period? That is missing. There's a gap. And unfortunately, fathers don't get to fill in that gap. We don't get to actually get, be a part of the, the uh, solution or be a part of the experience because they just say he left. Now, here's what he left means. This is what it mostly means and nobody wants to deal with this. He left the mother. He didn't leave the children. He didn't leave the family. There was a disconnect between the mother and the father. And it could have been simply, there was a war. He came back, he wasn't in good mental health. He had to relocate for a job. The family stayed here, he moved over here. Eventually, there was a little bit of separation. The mother probably said, well, if you're not gonna be here, all of that kind of stuff, we don't know. He could have been disenfranchised and lost his job, making it tough for him to support his family. So he had to go through a t transition. He could have found a new girlfriend. She could have cheated on him. There's a variety of things that could have happened, but we never fill in the gap. We just say, he left. Thus leaving the mother to be responsible for raising the child. This is bad phraseology in our, in our uh, lexicon because we accept it. Fathers leave families. Fathers leave young men. Fathers aren't taking responsibility. Have you ever heard a person say, and this is what we're doing here. Thanks for Anthony for putting this on. Have you ever heard a person say, men need to lead? Have you ever heard that? A lot of women say this. Typically, women that aren't raised by fathers. Okay? And they might say, because I don't have a father, I had to be a better person and I had to assume the, res the father responsibility or I had to learn how to live without a father. And I also had to become strong and independent. That's because men aren't leading. Now, what we do here is we get up here and we talk to men. This is our form of leadership. This is our patriarch. We're actually passing on our information and our experiences to other men. This is a leadership. Then we go out to the real world and we say, we're gonna lead, we're examples of leaders, we're doing the leading. You're accepting it, but then when you go out to the real world, guess what they say? These people are knuckle dragger, Neanderthal, cavemen, misogynist, renegade pigs, anti-feminist, so forth and so on, right? And we're like, but we're leading. You know what the response back is, is, yeah, see, we want you to lead, but not like that. Not like that. But wait a minute, if you're a leader, can you really have other people who want to be led, require you to lead, dictate how you lead? That's very difficult. That is a line that is very difficult to do it. And now a lot of CEOs and a lot of people who are head coaches, they will say, well, when you get to the leadership position, you need to be good at listening. Meaning they're passing off the responsibility. I'm just going to listen to these people and blah, blah, blah. But the problem is, Many times you don't have time to listen to everybody. You only have time to make decisions. We call that the moment of truth meets the point of no return. Sometimes I have to make a decision quickly without the input of everyone else. Many times it has to be that fast. If every decision I get to, tough, difficult decision, and I stop and say, okay, gentlemen, okay, ladies, let's have a combination of input, well, the moment's gone. Moment of truth has arrived, point of no return, has passed, and now I can't make the impact. So people want to dictate how we do this, and I think it's going to be the error. It's going to be a fabulous error, and this is why men can't lead him when they try to lead. Sometimes they're in a household where they say men need to lead, and the woman says, well, not like that. We need you to lead, but we don't like how you're leading. And they make it difficult, and so thus, He's put in a difficult position. Do I stay here and fight this individual or do I just abandon ship? There's a phrase we have in the child support argument. 
is washing your hands. Okay? You can just wash your hands in a situation. Many men have washed their hands in their relationships with their children because it was complicated trying to lead the mother. And it was better to just, we got millions of sperm, I can make another one just like that. And they'll try again somewhere else. But it's difficult. So he'll go get a pack of Newports, he'll say, son, I'm going to get a pack of Newports, and he'll just abandon the ship. It's a sad reality, but it's attributed to people not receptive of leadership, people questioning the leader, people thinking that this person doesn't have proper context to lead them, only in their absence to blame the individual for not leading. Many people that went to go get a pack of Newports went through a custody issue. They went through police being called on them, which I call plantation politics, okay? They'll call the overseer over and make it hard for this individual because they're in an emotional situation and they break the bond between the father and the son and they break the bond between the father and the daughter simply to punish this guy. We're gonna punish you because you made me feel a certain way and I'm gonna keep the kids away from you or make it difficult to access the kid just to punish you. This is what we accept in our society as normal behavior. And it's a sad reality. But we know children that don't have fathers, we also wrestle with this, are more likely to drop out, more likely to be teenage pregnancies, more likely to commit crimes, more likely to be emotionally stunted. We're gonna get to that when we get to the Oedip Oedipus complex, okay? There's seven layers to being a people and a nation. You might wanna write this down because there's no slide, okay? Number one, you have to have the individual. You have to be able to be a good, proper individual, have leadership qualities, be able to raise children, and so forth and so on. You have to be a complete individual. In our romantic world, we say we're gonna find someone to complete us. This is not necessary. That's myth and fairy tale. We need to become in as complete as possible in order to raise children. The second layer is gonna be the family, which I support two parent households. People think I'm against marriage. I'm against a modern marriage, but the best way to raise kids is in a two parent household. The family consists of the mother, the father, and the children. That's the family not your cousins and uncles and all of them. The third layer is gonna be the tribe. Now your cousins and uncles come into that. But your true family is your mo the mother, father, and the children. That's your family. This is why a wife traditionally has taken the last name of you, right? Your, your lineage, and you create the family. This is why at that particular point, she should be under the guidance of you, not her father anymore. This is why the father traditionally has walked the daughter down the aisle and transitioned the leadership to the husband. You're now the family. She's absent of her father now. But we've gone away from these things and women have said, I'm not going to take your last name anymore and I'm gonna keep my own last name, which is her grandfather's last name, but we won't have that discussion because we're dumb and we can't lead. But she wants to keep her grandfather's last name. We have all these ridiculous ideas of making traditional marriage and family work, but we're using progressive ideas, which literally they're removing the father. They're saying the father's not leading. We're gonna have an equal partnership. This is all a bizarre world because you have the individual, the family, the tribe. That's three. That consists of the male needing to lead. And that all starts with the male. Number four, from the tribe goes the community. And the black community, <laughs> which is one of the dumbest phrases in the world, because there's no solid community. Like everywhere you go, there's one everywhere else. <laughs> like what is that community? There's no sense of community there. But the community is important because you're surrounded. These are the people you're surrounded by. Your tribe tends to be, and traditionally were, part of the community. And you then become a part of everyone else's tribe. 
and there are rules and guidelines in communities. Anyone live in a community? And they say, these are the community guidelines. These are community rules. Don't do this, don't do that. Well, you have that in the community. And each tribe gets together. They get together with the other tribe and they protect their community. The fifth one layer to that is the city. People have pride in their city. I ride for my city and I die for my city. Yeah, man, cities are important because we wanna keep our cities doing well. We need men to do that. After that is the state. We do have pride in our states. Many of us will ride and die and represent for our state and whatnot. And after that is the nation. That is the order in which everybody is held accountable for and men are to lead. It starts with the individual and it goes all the way down. Now, when you mess with that order, you have chaos you're gonna have a chaotic situation. So if the men aren't strong, that means the families are not gonna be strong. That means your tribes are gonna be in chaos. Many of you guys have chaotic tribes, crackhead, aunts and uncles and criminals and whatever you guys have. And the biggest pieces of trailer park trashes that you could imagine, right? You got that, but you can fix that inside. But you have a breakdown of everything else. And then the result of that is obviously the nation, the cities, the states, the nations are gonna be in chaos. Do we have that today? Yes, it starts because men don't lead. It starts with the individual. They're not encouraged to lead. My man's out here smoking packs of Newport and chilling. And of course you have irresponsible people spreading their seed across and not taking responsibility of the kids, okay? So these are the orders that we need to protect and these are the orders where you find your solutions. Every solution starts going back to that order because it can get solved quicker. If you start with the nation first, the nation needs to do this, or you say the government needs to do this, meaning the president, the Supreme Court, and so forth and so on, well, they can't pinpoint each individual. They don't have a, they don't have a need to do that. They don't have a need to understand each individual. They have to govern everyone else so they can't do it. But many times you will say that the government has this and there's institutional that and they need to fix this and they need to fix that when the reality is the individual, the family and the tribes need to fix each other first. Then you go into the communities, the cities and the states. Then you can engage in the nation. That's the order of male leadership. As a result of many men not raised by women, we now seek our solutions, not from men, but from the government, the nations, the states, and the cities. It's chaos. It's disorder, and it's actually something that benefits more women than men, okay? That's how they find solutions to their issues here. Let's see if I can get this up. One more thing here, in terms of men, aging men. A lot of things can be understood of how we treat older men. Many people may use the phrase, the phrase elder. Elders. Older and elder is not, uh, uh, they don't go together. Elder is somebody that you would look up to. But hopefully if someone ages properly with their mental, physical, and their chronological age, you will have elders. We have a lot of people who have stunted mental ages and they can't lead. Many times they don't have a father. But I want to show you how men get disrespected as they age. Which is not traditional. Men who used to age used to be the men who passed on the tradition to the young. But in our culture, we completely disrespect and disregard manhood. Which is going to break this father and son bond. Because a son's going to want to test He's want to become the Lion King. He want to become the next leader, and he's not even prepared because he doesn't have a father figure. Let me give you a couple examples. Uh, one is called the, uh, uh, the midlife crisis. Anybody heard of that shit? Midlife crisis. Oh, look at him. Look at him. Oh, look at him. Oh, he bought a Corvette. He went and bought a 911. Look at him because he's getting older, he realizes he's gonna die and he needs to have his fun, his last swing and attempt at attracting hot females and so forth and so on. Now this is 
little more than shaming language for a man who has arrived in a leadership position or at least leadership age. And it is also a guy who's probably have enough resources to stack to be able to afford that after sacrificing some 25 years towards his family. And now his family has aged, his kids are teens and going into their early adulthood, and now he can enjoy the fruits of his labor. But because we don't want men to enjoy life, we always gotta have him uh, sacrificing and risking and giving up instead of buying the 911. He's got to upgrade the house, the castle for the wife so she can interior decorate the entire room with, you know, wa with, with, with uh, flower wallpaper and stuff. See, this is a shot at men. Oh man, don't enjoy life. No, 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 sir. Keep sacrificing. That's not important. The midlife crisis is a shot at men who get to the leadership position. Let me give you another example. Have you ever heard, and I'm gonna use art, sports, entertainment as examples because people can correct, uh, quickly connect to them. Doesn't mean these people are important in our society, but I can give you examples and people will automatically know it. You know, yes. In sports, if a basketball player gets to the age of 35, what do they say? He is probably gonna be washed up. He washed, he got nothing left. Well, in comparison to the 20 year olds that are coming in, yeah. But he's still a veteran. He still might be able to offer something to some, some teams. And when putting teams together, they will pay a veteran to come in to do what? He needs a leadership, he's a locker room leadership. He's going to uh, train the quarterback in, in waiting or any of these things. Cause they use that leadership and experience to help the next group of people. So he's still valuable but we cannot wait till LeBron James is washed up because he's 35, 38. And guess what? LeBron James is still going. He figured out, I'm not going to fall for this. I'm going to get washed up. Is he going to run out of gas? Yeah. He won't be able to continue, continue this. His bones are going to get a little bit more uh, stronger, meaning they could easily break, easily risk of injury and so forth and so on. Yeah. But we say these people are washed up. You don't belong out there and we put them out the pasture, and there's a lot of disrespect. Instead of saying this person has something valuable to offer. Let me give you another example. Um, if you listen to rock or rap music, if you are a 35 year old rapper or more, they'd be like, look at this fool out here, old ass rapper. As if you can't put rhymes together at age 35. I don't know. I didn't realize rhyming stopped at 35 or 40, but apparently it does because you're doing something that they attribute to young people. You got nothing to offer. You're an old ass, washed up ass, broke ass. There was a guy actually, uh, uh, an internet personality that called all these guys dusty. Are oh, they all dusty and dirty and broke at? Why can't they take those skills, pass them on? Why can't they be executives? Why can't they mentor the young rappers? Nope, they're washed up, put them to the side. This is what we do to men. Instead of using this as these men could be leaders and encourage us to maybe stop shooting each other over beefs. But this is an idea of washed up, all right? Putting men out to their pasture. Now men are known to get a little bit more mature and sexier as they get older. This is the anti-wall. So much so that many of your sexiest men alive have been men over 40. Because women do value this leadership instinctively. They do find men that fill out a little bit of their bodies instead of being bird chested. Long, young men, you know, they got abs. They be on the internet with their abs. I'm like, yeah, but you skinny though. Like you can have abs when you skinny, but it's harder to keep them abs when you don't filled out as a man and you all burly. But these are things that we actually look at. Women naturally are gonna seek out older men because they have stability. They have the ability and have ex exhibited experiences of being child raisers and all of this stuff. So people naturally seek that out. But young men tend to try to test us and push us to the side. 
This is because they don't expect or they don't value the responsibilities that men traditionally have upheld. Let's talk about this son husband epidemic. Oh, the picture's messed up, but you see this picture. It should be fuzzy. This is my censored picture here. Let's talk about these damn son husbands, yo. All right. This is Kevin Durant. This is a picture of him smooching his mother. That's his mama. Now, there are several pictures of this. If you Google this, there are several pictures of them kissing just like this. This isn't one, there's about 10 or 15. Many men will win their championship and they will bring their wives. They might be solo. They don't really bring their mama up and do this type of behavior out in public. But people found this endearing. Oh my God, Kevin Durant and the mom. Did you see them? They have a wonderful relationship. Uh, this is a little past wonderful. It's going to be a little bit very a more uncomfortable type relationship. But many men do have this relationship in the community that when they don't have a father, they have to have this type of relationship with the mother because they've gone through tough times. They've overcome the odds. I mean, I don't know who his father is, but obviously she hit the genetic lottery or he did enough for him to have a seven foot eight wingspan and have the athleticism of a five foot nine guy. So she wins because she endured all of that enough for him, her to capitalize on his ability, his natural ability, God gifted ability. And thus she can take credit for making him that. Now I want to watch this, watch this. If he became a criminal and thug, whose fault is it? Daddy, dad's fault. I didn't have no daddy and all my homies got locked up or killed. All that bullshit. But because he was able to have God given ability because she, she gave a man who had this genetic combination access to her, then she can say, I did it. And, she, and he actually credits her as being the real MVP when he won the MVP award. He cried, you the real MVP. A lot of men do that in the NFL because these people tend to come from fatherless homes. If you look at it, the son husband believes that the woman, the mother can do no wrong. She can do no wrong. She's the queen, even when she's doing wrong. There's an example of Tupac, who has a song called Dear Mama, in which he says, and I quote, my mother was a crack fiend mama, but now she is a black queen mama. Hold up, let's go back. Wait a minute. Does he get a pass if he was a crack fiend? Would he get a pass? He don't even get a pass for going to get a pack of Newports. He don't even get a pass for going to a pack of Newports. He gets to get all the damn, it was your fault. But the mother's a queen. The son husband believes that the mother is the queen no matter what. She can do no wrong. The other thing the son husband does, he's afraid to confront women when they're wrong. A lot of us do this as a natural sense of protection. So you see a woman staggering and stumbling her way through an argument or a debate, and I'm debating her and I'm giving her the business. I'm whipping her into the rope and I'm giving her the big boot. And then I take my elbow pad off, throw it into the audience, bounce off the ropes and hit her with the rock bottom elbow drop. You know who's gonna save her? A dude. Now he should save her if I'm harassing her, slandering her and so forth. There should be no need for me to just be talking reckless about her. But if she did engage in some sort of debate or an argument, there was a car accident, she caused it, so I believe, and I get in and say, what the hell's wrong with you? 
Here comes Mighty Mouse. Here I come to save the day. And he will swoop in. He will have seen the wrong done, but he would say, we need to take it easy on this one. When they're wrong, a son husband believes they've done no wrong. They will not call their mothers out. How many, has, how many men in here have perfect parents? Not many. I'm a parent and I'm far from perfect. But how many men have perfect moms? Everybody. Oh, my mom was. knowing she made some mistakes. When the father makes mistakes, we don't have any problems calling out. That's what son husbands typically do. Another characteristic of the son, um, the son husband is, have you ever heard somebody talk about somebody's mama? Your mama's so fat, your mama hair so thin, or your mama hair bald, and The natural response that people have trained people to do is go crazy, like the Tasmanian devil. I know you ain't talking about my mama. I'll kill you if you talk reckless about my mama. I know you ain't talking about my mama. You brought your mama in there. I brought. Now, what in the hell is that? It's just your mother. Now, do we do this? You know, your daddy. And you sit there and take it. You'd be like, yeah, my daddy is a piece of shit. Okay. <laughs> you don't have the same come to the rescue sense when people talk about dad, but you will with mom. You'll go to prison defending your mama. You'll go to prison defending your mom. When just somebody's just talking about her, that might not even know her. That's not a big deal. <laughs> okay. That's what you believe. That's what you believe. You need to get off my mom, I just got off yours. Should be the appropriate response. And it's all here. And then you might be a victim of some violence. But the son husband goes above and beyond to defend the mother. And we call these men pea sitting down men. This is what I call them. These are pea sitting down men. These men were taught in the absence of the father to pea sitting down as to not disrupt the slumber of the mother. See, by the time she falls asleep, the young boy gets up, he's 12. He can halfway hit the uh, toilet with his piss. When he pees, it makes a lot of noise. And the mother's like, the hell is this shit? Don't make all that noise pissing. And so he'll go in there, three in the morning, piss in that toilet, wake up the whole house because she lives in a one bedroom apartment with three kids. And then she will say to him, you know, why don't you sit down and pee? Just, you don't need to stand up. It's not because maybe biologically it might be better to piss it down. There's signs that might say that. It's not because of that, it's because it's disrupting her. Nah, just pee sitting down. And you'll be taught to piss sitting down. And then you'll get back in bed with your mama and cuddle with her and coat co-sleep with her too. We have that going on now. Many celebrities are saying, I co-sleep with my nine-year-old son. We'll get to the Oedipus complex later. How that disrupts the natural maturity of the son and breaks the father and son bond immediately. Okay. Now, we also call these men, men who expose their tampon strings. Okay. So these are men who expose their tampon strings to the world when they will die for their mama, okay? See, I told my mother one time, and I love her, so she might be watching this, why do you talk like that about me? <laughs> I love you, mom. You can love your mom, you don't, you know. But I told her once, there's a time when the son has to lead the mother. I don't, follow, I don't follow you anymore. I'm a mature man. I lead you now. Because she is now at the age where she needs leadership. She doesn't have a husband. I ain't gonna have to serve as that because she's gonna age. She can no longer push through the corporate America and all of those dreams that America is sold, women, particularly black women. So I lead you now. 
and I have to watch out for you. I have to make sure that the, the Nigerian phone scam doesn't happen to you and the email scam and all of that shit. I got to make sure you don't lose all of your property doing some quick, quick, well, get rid of quick scheme, right? I got to make sure, hey, everything's secure at your place. As she ages even further than that, I have to make sure she's seeing the doctor, right? I have to be there after she's available for surgery or making herself available for, for I got to do these things. So therefore, I have input in her life and what she's doing. I lead her. And I had an co uncomfortable conversation about, hey, you did your best. You may be the man I am. You led me, now I lead you. She accepted it. But it was a hard conversation for her to accept. And many men let their mama lead them when she can really offer you not very much into the, as far as input as a man. She's never been a man, remember that. Your mother's never been a man. She's never had the responsibility of a man. I don't care what she did. She could be a uh, construction worker. She's never done it. But if she's still giving you guidance in life, she might misguide you. She's not going to get the blame you are. Can't be the son husband after a, a while. Okay? I believe, and this might be controversial, I believe mothers do their best up to age 12 for a young man. And after that, that's it. That's about it. She can't do nothing much after that, age 12. There were tribes in Africa that would rip the young boy from the mother. That's it. We got it from here. While they were going from zero to 12, they were out doing what they needed to do, being creative, protecting, providing, so forth and so on. But after age 12, that's it. She can't do shit for you. She might be able to love you and tell you to watch out for them 304s, but that's it. Job's done. Thank you, mom. In many custody situations, I'm like, the son needs to be from up under that mom when they're in their teens, or she's gonna destroy that boy. Absolutely destroy him. And I believe it to be true. Statistically, it is true. Like the statistics show this. Sometimes if you're that father and she's fighting you, which means your baby mother or your ex-wife, and she's fighting you so much that it's gonna cost you, some men just say, I'm gonna wash my hands of this shit, and they go get Newports. Some men fight and spend millions of dollars trying to conquer that. There's a brother here, I believe his name is Jeffrey. He's going through the custody battle with the transitioning child. The mother's destroying that child. He's spending millions of dollars to try to make sure that his relationship with his son is healthy when the son's 16 to 40, 16 to 50. That's what he's doing. He's trying to protect that child. But she's not allowing that because she's, again, using the child against the father to punish him. And she's willing to destroy that child in the name of whatever agenda. I don't care what you think about the process. She's destroying the child to get back at the father. And she's allowing that to happen. Okay, let's talk about, this is the mother, the, the mother and the child. Uh, this is a young boy. I once saw, I'm divorced, uh, I was divorced when my son was five. We split, separated, my daughter six, he was five. And um, very contentious, it's always, and it's still contentious to this day. Um, her grandparents, uh, I saw the, my children's grandparents on the mother's side, we were at my daughter's tennis match. By this time, my son's 10, 11. He's growing up to be that man that needs to start to be a young man. Well, the grandparent, in an attempt to try to keep the son away from me during these things, you know, they do these microaggressions, death by a thousand cuts. They won't let the kid just roam and be free. So my son's 10, damn near 11. The grandmother takes my son and puts the son on her lap. That's her attempt to destroy him as a man. I don't know, remember when you were 10, did you want to sit on your damn grandmama's lap? You might be thinking as a parent, well, that ain't that bad. Go back to when you were 10. You were probably fifth grade. Did you want to be sitting on your grandmother's lap in public? 
That's a emasculation tactic that people use, but it wasn't towards to emasculate him, it was to punish me. But she was willing to emasculate him by doing that. So I said, no, you're not going to be sitting on anybody's lap from this point forward. And I got them from that situation. They called the police on me because that was inciting, that was some sort of violation of custody order and so forth and so on. This is how women emotionally punish young men to get back at the father. Then later on when I say, well, fuck all this shit, I don't wanna, know. oh, he left. That would be the story, he left. See, this is how men get out of these situations. You don't fight hard enough. We don't put up with all that microaggressions. And then when they do a microaggression and I say, well, she had my son sitting on his grandmother's lap. What's wrong with that? We can't lead. We need you to lead, but not like that. You see, you get stuck in this paradox of emotional bullshit that we've allowed as men. We've allowed this stuff, okay? And so the mother will create this close bond with the child, but the child won't be allowed to create this bond with the father. This is called, and Sigmund Freud, whether you like him or not, called this a part of the Oedipus complex. And we're gonna go through a couple of stages. He has five stages. We're not gonna go through them specifically, but we're gonna highlight a portion of the Oedipus complex that you might need to be aware of. I'm gonna get there in a second. Okay, so according to Freud, a child must overcome conflict at each stage of his sexual development because that's what we're doing. We're maturing sexually, okay? And this is for him to be able to develop healthy sexual desires and behaviors. Now, this is actually true. Most of his context was related around sexuality. People are uncomfortable about that because we live in a Puritan society where we actually, we actually believe that sex doesn't happen. The stork delivers babies. Like, we kind of try to avoid the conversation of sexuality, which actually stunts our growth, but I get why people try to protect people, but we go too far with it. And Sigmund Freud was talking about these sexual relationships and desires as either healthy or unhealthy. And I can pretty much attest that people have a lot of unhealthy sexual behaviors. And that comes from lack of maturity. Pimp culture, that's some single mom, son, husband bullshit. Because much of the stuff that they display and prioritize is around sex. That sex makes them the man, okay? Many of these pimps wear flashy clothes like women. They have hairstyles like women. They value jewelry and shoes and bullshit like women. And when I tell people this, ooh, people get mad at me because we uphold this individual in our society as some, having some sort of success. But he's actually an addition of the son. She's, he's an extension of the mother, son, husband, surrounded by aunts that like to get perms. And he was a young boy watching this and them being happy about perming their hair. And so his dumb ass, gets in there and he perms his hair to fit in, or he braids it in cornrows, which in the 90s was a male's hairstyle. In the 80s, it was a girl's hairstyle. But because men didn't have fathers around, their little sisters, their aunts, mama and grandmama braided the son's hair. Now I know there's cultures that have braids and all of that shit and long hair and short hair. In that example, that ex is an extension of an absent father, okay? Now, in the Oedipus complex, it says right here, when the Oedipus complex is not successfully resolved during the phallic stage, an unhealthy fixation can develop and remain. It says right here, this leads to boys becoming fixated on their mothers and then girls being fixated on the father. It says right here, and this causes them to choose romantic partners that resemble the opposite sex parent as adults. How many guys have said, I want a woman just like my mother? The fuck? That's kind of weird. You know what I mean? Because I never would look at my mother as a romantic partner. Now, maybe you might be talking about everything else, but if I choose a partner sexually, I would have to actually go there with that partner. And if she's like my mom? Mm. We also do this with, with daughters as well, okay? 
she'll end up choosing a man just like her father, right? We got to do that as well. And that's what uh, Sigmund Freud was talking about. Now, here's where the problem leads. Here's where the problem leads. So there's Newport dad trying to get in again. Dad trying to come back. He's trying to come back all the time. All right, so anyway, he comes back when I get drafted in the NBA. <laughs> and then he's like, son, million dollar son. Okay, but uh, here we go. Now, it says right here, when, it, when, when the boy is between the age of three and six, this is development, he becomes unconsciously sexually attracted to his mother. I know that's uncomfortable, but he was just breastfeeding on the woman. Okay, so we have to understand that this is actually happens. And he may become hostile towards the father and looks at the father as a rival. I'll give you an example because it sounds weird. But if you've ever had children and a wife or a girlfriend and your children were around, they were young, three to six, and you went to your wife and you gave her a kiss. What would the kid typically do? Clap or try to break that shit up? The kid would probably look, that's my mom. She's mine. And he might break that up. No, you can't be kissing on that. No, 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 no. What is this? I'll give you another example. If you ask a young kid in this age, who do they want to marry? Who are they going to say? If it's a, the son, he'll say, I want to marry mommy. If it's a daughter, I want to marry daddy. Why? That's their world. That's all they can see. When they go out in public, everybody other than mom and dad is stranger danger. They're almost invisible. This is why kids will do dumb shit and run out in front of people and they don't see nothing but mom and dad. So they become fixated with mom and dad. They don't know anything about sexual dynamics between Two people, they know nothing. They just want to marry mom. Your son just want to marry his mama. If you're in a custody battle and the child's between that age and you move out to another place and the son has to be dropped off for your custody exchange, that kid might cry, I miss my mama. And then the mom's like, see, he don't even want to go over there. This is because they have this fixation with the mom and vice versa, the daughter with the dad, okay? And sometimes this is actually used to, used against the dad. He doesn't like to be around the dad. He cries when he's with the dad. See, these are something that happened. Here's the thing right here. Envy and jealousy are aimed at the father. This is in reference to the son. He may become jealous of the father and envious of the father because he has a close attachment with the mom. He may want to break that up. And the father is the object of the mother's affection and attention. He, sh she, he should be. <laughs> We're kind of getting away from that as well, but that's a whole nother conversation. So if the father has a good sexual or healthy relationship with the mother, the, the son might, hey, what's going on here? Okay, that's my woman. <laughs> I came from her, right? I, I get fed through her. And it's right here, these feelings for the mother and rivalry towards the father, it leads to fantasizing him getting rid of the father and then taking the place of the father. You don't like your daddy, do you? He mean to you, huh? He spanks you, he disciplines you. Yeah, mommy, we don't need his ass. Okay, oh, he don't like the father, and then this can happen, okay? Some people have this hyper experience. Some people have it micro. But this is actually what happens in our culture. Now, this is the important part. This is the important part that many people miss, unfortunately. Because many people do get divorced when these kids are five, six, seven, eight, and so forth, right? Mostly before the teenage years, because people know Teenagers are going to see through that shit, right? <laughs> They're going to be like, wait, who, what, what? Give me the details. What you do? You cheated on mama? All right. Mama, you cheated with the milkman? What, who, what? And they're going to choose sides. Teenagers are aware. And not only that, they're going to expose the fractured relationship. Because they get like, now nah, it's time for me to do what the hell I want to do. And they can disrupt that. Many times they can't be used uh, emotionally against the other parent. But kids can. So many people see that as a jump off point. Okay. A point of disruption. At this point, very important, 
to cope with this anxiety, the anxiety of the father being a rival, the son identifies with the father. This is after age six. He starts to closely identify with the father. I want to go with daddy. He going fishing? I want to go with daddy. He going to play basketball? I want to go with daddy. And then what happens is, it says right here, this means the son adopts and internalizes the attitude, characteristics, and values that the father holds, meaning related to personality, gender roles, masculine type, dad behaviors, and so forth. Have you ever noticed that, that around this age, he wants to be around dad, he wants to do what dad's doing, he's impressed with the dad, dad's doing all these fabulous and great things. Hey dad, I wanna try, dad, teach me how to do this. Dad, what would you do in this situation, okay? Dad might start coaching his football team, his basketball team, his hockey team, little league, whatever it is. The son wants to be more around dad at this age group. Now think about this, many young boys don't get this chance. And what they'll do is they'll see the dad as rival. He's jealous of the dad. He doesn't like the dad. He don't respect the dad. I love my mama. Don't talk about my mama. What happens is a lot of boys don't get this. Even in marriages, the mother will disrupt this. In bad marriages, they'll disrupt this. Oh, baby, don't you want to co-sleep with me? You're nine years old. No, 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 no. And that dad's trying to sleep in the same bedroom. He got to go sleep in the same man cave. These are examples, okay? So in the Oedipus complex, the son starts to do what? Identify himself as the, as the dad. If you're a father, the best thing you can do is understand this. Stop talking to your son, he ain't listening. But he's watching you, he watching you. And you don't even know it. My son had a funny thing when I took him to a hockey game. I'm walking and he follows me and we get to the point where you know, you're walking through a crowd so you're kind of walking in single file. And he's talking about the way I walk. Dad, I don't like the way you walk. I was like, how do I walk? You walk all cool like you. But he's watching me. I can't see him watching me, but he's noting the way I walk. And he's processing this. This is exposure to him. He might not like it, but he's mentally processing. He's taking note. Sooner or later, he'll be walking just like you. You walk confidently. You think you're cool. Why do you think you're cool? Oh, you're a self-made man, essentially. That goes with it. I walk like this because I'm confident. I walk with my head up, chest out, stomach in, shoulders back. That's how you should walk, son. Don't walk. We call them tippy-toe men. You see these boys out here looking like a damn, I can fly, I can fly, I can fly. That's because they walk like they mama or they have a non-confident father. Your, your son at this age might start liking the same sports team as you like. My son likes the Raiders, cause I like the Raiders. Now the Raiders are struggling and his, his friends give him pure hell. And my son wants to jump off the bandwagon. He'd be like, God damn dad, what's wrong with us? Shit, I don't know, man. He don't, have the, he don't have the history of liking the Raiders like I like them. But he rides with me when we're together. I got season tickets. He goes to the game. He be raided out. He cheering. He's excited. We go to Oakland. When they were in Oakland, I took them to Oakland. When they go to play in L.A., we go to see them play in L.A. We follow them around. And he's riding. Now, when he get with his friends, he probably be like, man, I really don't like them. You know? He'll start to develop his own identity. He's going into being a 16-year-old boy now. He'll find his own team. But at this age, he starts to identify. We like the Niners. Yep. You like the Niners? We like the Niners. Like the Buffalo Bills? We like the Buffalo Bills. That's our team. And this is the strength and the bond that is broken in our society right here. We never get to get to this point. And even if we do, it gets disrupted by all of this bullshit. Okay? It says right here, the father becomes a role model rather than a rival. Previously, he was a rival. Don't mess with mom. Now he's a role model. He starts to model your behavior. It says right here, through the identification, uh, through this identification with the aggressor, the previous aggressor, boys acquire their super ego and their male sex role. What does dad do? I'm gonna watch him. And they're watching you, bro. Your kids watch you. They don't listen to a damn thing you say. 
I always encourage fathers, stop talking to your kids so long. Don't be going on, and now I'm guilty of this too. Your kid messes up. Sit down. I'm going to tell you something about life. When I was a young boy, they ain't listening to nothing you said. And they're like, I ain't about to listen to this shit. Repeat what I said. Tell me what I said. Uh, at a certain age, them long ass talks, they're not needed. Now, if he's in the trouble, he wants to sit down and share. Remember when kids share with you. Don't make judgments, don't insert anything. Listen, because once you start doing that, they're going to realize, oh, this person's judging me. Now they're going to stop sharing with you. And that's when you have trouble with teens, okay? When they stop sharing. You want them to share some shit, even if it's some shit you're like, damn. You want them to share. Because at that point, you can gather intel and information and shit, okay, God dang, all right? You can develop a plan in the background. Give them a little bit of guidance, let them go. Then you call up the other parent and be like, God damn, son, you know what your son doing? Oh, shit. All right? So this is an important thing, and it says the boy then substitute the desire for his mother and the desire for other women. Now he can make a healthy what Freud was trying to get at, I can make a healthy sexual relationship, healthy relationships, healthy bond with the father, healthy bond with the mother. But unfortunately, this is disrupted constantly by our society, by the media, by entertainment, by how we judge men, by how we tell men you ain't shit past 35 and 40. You're a loser, midlife crisis, you went pack, got pack of Newports, custody battles, divorce, Everything is disrupted with no plan for the child. I want you to understand this. This might be bad for you. You might feel bad. But your mother doesn't, doesn't have a plan for you. Your mother has no plan for you as a man. Zero. Ask your mother what she plans for you, she might say, well, I pray to God that you have wisdom and knowledge. That's not a plan. Well, I hope that you graduated from high school and don't get shot by the police. That ain't no plan. My baby ain't never hurt nobody. My baby, he was a good boy. She has no plan. I tell women this all the time. You ain't got no plan. You hope he becomes Kevin Durant, in that way, you can look like a queen. Have you understood this? A woman that loses her child in something like a violent act, a ghetto fight in situation. There's several examples of this that Black Lives Matter has capitalized on and made $90 million. But if your son becomes a victim, George Floyd, Michael Brown, of the police brutality that happens in communities, which is a direct line from the failure of the mother driving the father out. Most of these boys had no father present. They weren't a couple. They might have been around, but they weren't a couple. Do you know that that is considered a sacrifice? She sacrificed the child, and I'm going to tell you why. Because now she forever is the good mother. She forever is the queen. Oh, you were raising a good boy until these bad people did something for you. And every time something happens, they drag her ass out, the media. Oh, tell these mothers about the victim of the last person that did this. Oh, baby, I tell you, oh, I'm the queen. And they come out and they treat her well. And they, forever she can make no mistakes because she's experienced this tragedy. But it's essentially a sacrifice because if you go back, through the whole damn lineage of that kid, there ain't nothing but death and destruction waiting for that kid anyway. Attribute it to the hands of the mother and the father in their relationship. He ain't went ahead nowhere anyway. I'm sorry to say that about people, but that's the truth. He wasn't going nowhere. Now don't put up the picture of him graduating and all that bullshit. But I also got pictures of his pants sagging and him tearing up the damn liquor store. Well, that doesn't mean, 
No, there's a video of him tearing up the liquor store. And you put up the picture of him graduating. What are we gonna do with this? Can we, can we have a truthful conversation about this? Nope. Because it makes the mother look bad. And it makes the father look like an asshole. See, he ain't had no daddy. And if his daddy would have stuck around and dealt with all my bullshit, he would have been a man and wouldn't got clapped by the police. See, this is all this bullshit. It's a human sacrifice, period. Got okay. Heard of this guy? 50 Cent, they call him. 50 Cent is going through something. We got about a minute or so left. He's going through something, 50, uh, 50 Cent is a rapper, self-made millionaire, several businesses and brands. This is his older son. His older son is now 25 years old, but because he was going through a divorce or a breakup early in his life when he was a young, young child, the mother decided to you know, keep the child close to 50 in this stage that we were talking about, age three to six. Now, after that, she took him through several court cases, tried to get more money from him. She ended up getting less money because 50 Cent played a good financial strategic plan against her, and she was getting 25,000 a month in child support, and it was put down to $6,000, roughly about $6,000 in child support. So I don't know if you know, $6,000 a month in child support is a good full-time job. She had not a lot of people make six grand a month, but that's what she was taking home, and it was for child support. And of course, when the kid turned 18, she ain't have no money left. What a shock. Because she used that as her source of income, which I instruct women, that's not what you're supposed to do with child support. You're supposed to pair that income used for the child with your income, but they use it to budget. Okay, it's a dumb move. So now he's 25 years old, he hates the father, and he's spewing everything the mother has ever said about the father today. I mean, he's going now on a tirade about 50 cent, and I'll pay him $6,000 a month to be a part of my life now. Well, guess what? The bond has been broken. He can come into his life right now and ain't gonna correct anything. He sees the father as a rival. He also sees he's envious of 50 cent. He's envious, he's jealous of 50 cent. He's still stuck in that first stage that he was when three to six. So now he wants to be the dad, but only out of spite. He'll never be, he'll never be his dad. Because by, by, by the time the father was his age, he was well on his way to be a millionaire. He was starting the path of millionaire. This kid ain't even, he ain't even starting it. And he's blaming the world that $6,700 a month in child support wasn't enough. We were broke. We didn't have the life that he had. Whose fault is that? Yo mama. Yo mama. Period. There he is. He spelled out in dollar bills entitled because people are calling him spoiled and entitled. But this is an example of the Oedipus complex not completing. He sees the father as a rival. Um, and now he's doing what? He's doing much damage to his reputation. He's attempting to do damage to the reputation of the father just as his mother had all those years. And he's just an example of his mother, because he identifies with the mom. Sad, sad story here. All right, we're not gonna go through that because we ran out of time here today, but if you wanna find me here, you can find me on YouTube right here. And that's the Free Agent Lifestyle Podcast on all podcast formats, pretty much all of them. That's my book, Free Agent Lifestyle and De Evolution. Thank you very much. All right, if you have any questions, I'm sure we can take time for questions on this one. And uh, I think you can need to go to the mic if you have any questions on that one. But, um, and feel free to challenge me on these things. If you love your mama, you wanna get up here, but Cole, what about my mama? And my mama is this. You hate your mama. Your mama black. Anybody? No? All right, thank you guys.